Good day, brothers and sisters. It's Sunday once again, and I hope that we're prepared to praise and worship the Lord. My good friend, Pastor Edmond Chan, stated in the recent IDMC held in Singapore that what he feels is lacking in the 21st century is the fear of the Lord. And so I don't really know where this is coming from, and perhaps it is coming from the fact that we have overemphasized the love of God at the expense of the holiness of God. And I think the holiness of God is something that has to be brought forth time and time again. Because the holiness of God, His absolute purity, is one of the reasons why we worship Him. We worship Him because He is transcendent. Because when we compare ourselves with God, we know that we are not the same as He is. In essence, in substance, He is pure. In so far as our case is concerned, we know that we are undeserving sinners saved by grace alone. And because of that, we know that there is a chasm, there is a distance between us and God. And that distance, of course, has been bridged by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why we have access into the very throne of God. But having said that, that doesn't place us on the same level as God. God remains transcendent, transcendent in purity, transcendent in power, transcendent in, in all things, in majesty, in glory. And that should, I believe, that I believe should result in bowing our knee and worshiping God. And so, friends, if you've lost that fear of God, understand that this was the exhortation of Solomon after he had backslidden and his life became miserable. I mean, he had tasted every bit and piece of the world and he still found himself empty. Life was vain, chasing after the wind. It was a worthless, meaningless life. And so what was his conclusion? His conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, is this. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep His commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. And so, friends, let us worship the Lord by having the fear of the Lord. Let's stand up and worship God.
the clouds its robe Who spoke and commanded the morning And gave the dawn its place Who scattered the wind from the east Who channeled the torrent of rain Trust but you You're the man 
hand to my feet. You're all I need. In your presence, I will sing. I give you my all. Take full control. I lay down my life before you.
cho tu lẽ mô y cao lang an pios y cao lang an pios sang mahi puri Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Great news everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. The title of today's sermon is The Pathway to Greatness. This is a two-part series, and so we will have a look at part one in this study. Let's take our text from Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, We are able. He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father." And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. 
it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you, Lord, for this blessed Sunday once again, a brand new year for us. And Lord, we trust that you will make all things new this new year even as we are determined, Lord, to turn over a new leaf in our lives. And Lord, we ask that your grace be upon us. Let our study today be meaningful. And we trust, Lord, that you will truly inculcate in us your biblical culture. Lord, we will give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. A lot of people desire greatness in various fields in life. For some people, they desire to become great in the field of business. Others, however, desire to be great perhaps in the political world. They want to be influential, maybe grab a seat in the Senate, or maybe even run for the presidency. There are some who want to excel in their employment and they want to be able to reach that time wherein they would become managers in their own field. And yet again, there are some who desire greatness in ministry. Now, a desire for greatness is not necessarily bad. I mean, a lot of, a lot of us equate a desire for greatness as being equal to pride. And of course, a lot of times that is true. But at other times, it is not necessarily the case. So once again, a desire for greatness is not necessarily a bad thing for as long as we have the right motives. And that is one thing that God wants us to have, pure motives. If ever we desire greatness, it is never egocentric. If we desire greatness, it is always God-glorifying. It is always designed or desired, rather, so that you and I might be an implement of God to extend His kingdom. Now, the path to greatness, however, is a difficult path. It is the path of suffering and servanthood. And this is our subject matter for today, and there is a threefold flow to our study. But for lack of time, we will divide this sermon into two parts. We will discuss points one and two today, and then we will finish up with point number three next weekend. But allow me to give you the whole flow of this sermon, parts one and two, so that we do not get lost in the flow of things. So in verses 20 to 21, we're going to talk about the ambitious request. In verses 22 to 23, you find the sobering response. In verse 22, under the sobering response, you have the required suffering. And in verse 23, the divine appointment. Now, the way of promotion is found in verses 24 to 28. And what we discover under this uh, particular a main point is the ambitious anger in verse 24, the worldly way in verse 25, and then the Christ way in verses 26 to 28. So allow me to unpack this sermon to you. We will begin with the ambitious request in verses 20 to 21. It says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. Now, by this time, and I'd like to provide to you the setting or the occasion by which this request was made. We have to understand that previously Jesus had already announced his death. In fact, he had announced it not just once, but three times already. And the third time Jesus announced it, he added 
even a detail. And that detail is that he would rise on the third day. Now, interestingly, in fact, intriguingly, there was no response from the disciples. Worse, it was at this time that their selfish ambitions came to the fore. Now, isn't this quite saddening that the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously, I, I don't think he was really looking for sympathy, but then I believe what he was looking for somehow is that the statements that he had made, the announcements he had made about his death should at least uh, provoke a response to the disciples, a response perhaps of uh, empathy, a response perhaps of uh, even sympathy and compassion. And, and somehow, this was not happening. And to think about the fact that the Lord Jesus had been their refuge for three long years. He was the one who provided for them. He was the one who taught them. He was the one who mentored them. He was the one who counseled them. He was the one who answered their questions. He was the one who, who fulfilled all of their requests. And so if you think about it, Jesus was the refuge. And now Jesus makes this announcement that he's about to die and you have no response. And usually when there is no response, it is because people are so consumed about themselves, consumed about their own agenda. They're not thinking about other people. They're only thinking about themselves. And sadly, this is what you and I will discover uh, with the request that was made by the mother of the two sons of Zebedee. The concern really was not with Christ. The thought really was with them, their promotion, their desire for greatness, their desire for influence and power. And sadly, there are a lot of people out there in the world who do not notice Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not the center of gravity for them. The center of gravity for them is themselves, their egos, their needs, their wants, their desires. And they're not mindful at all at what the Lord Jesus is saying. They're not mindful at all with the Word of God. And again, that is very sad because Jesus has been put on the periphery of people's lives. He has been marginalized. He has not become the center of gravity. And therefore, the sad thing is that people are practically lost, spiritually speaking. They're even spiritually blind and deluded. And that is why we have to be very, very careful about our own hearts because our own hearts have this tendency to really be focused on the wrong things. And that is why oftentimes we find people with the wrong priorities in life. And so their worldview is, is really very selfish. Their worldview is very carnal, very materialistic, even lustful, I would say. And so going back to the story, the mother of James and John came to Jesus with her two sons and bowed before him. And when Jesus inquired what her request was, she asked her that her two sons might be granted places of favor, one seated at Jesus' right hand and the other one on the left. Now, the word command, by the way, is an aorist imperative, which means that she was practically mandating Jesus to be, to be given, or rather he was mandate, she was mandating Jesus to give to her two sons the most important positions in the kingdom. Now, once again, even the mother of James and John were not mindful of the uh, situation that was about to take place in Jesus' life. Something horrible was going to take place. Jesus was going to suffer in the ha under the hands of man, and, and he was going to be tortured. He was going to be crucified. And he was the mother of James and John, not really concerned and mindful of what would happen to Jesus, only mindful about her two sons. Now you ask the question, where is this coming from? Where is this request coming from? Well, perhaps she had heard Jesus say 
that his disciples would be seated on thrones. We find this uh, in Matthew 19, verse 28, if you recall. It says, And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, this alone happens to be a lofty promise. And we have to understand all these disciples were undeserving sinners. And they were not the cream of the crop, so to speak. They were even provincial people, most of them at least. And, and they were not educated under rabbinic tradition. And so if you're talking about qualifications, the fact that the Lord said that they will be sitting upon 12 thrones was, was really a lofty promise already. And yet the sad thing is the mother of James and John, and her name, by the way, is Salome, according to tradition, was not content with that. She was not content that her two sons would be judging the 12 tribes or two of the tribes of Israel. She wanted the positions of left and right, obviously the most important positions in the kingdom of heaven. And so with typical motherly pride, she felt her sons deserved the two best positions, most especially because, and this is something that some of you may not know because it's not written in the scriptures, but it's written down in, in tradition. And uh, in other words, we're talking about something that is extra biblical literature. But I think this is quite accurate, that they indeed had a blood relationship with Jesus. And the case is that Salome happens to be the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So what does that make Salome? Well, that makes Salome the auntie of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, James and John happen to be cousins. And not just cousins, not second or third degree cousins, but first cousins. And so there was really this very, very close relationship. And in this case, the appeal of the mother was really more of nepotism. That, you know, she was saying, you know, my sons deserve to be on the left and on the right. After all, you know, they are your relatives. They, they are your first cousins. And so give them the best positions in the kingdom of heaven. Now, we are not at all saying that blood relationships should be a deterrent. When it comes to God's appointments, you and I know that the Lord had somehow appointed people who were related to him by blood. John the Baptist, for example, happens to be another cousin. And this time, one of his or two of his disciples happened to be his own cousins as well. You're talking about James and John. So there's nothing really long, wrong rather in terms of blood relationships and being part of kingdom work. Having said that, we are to be mindful that it is God who appoints people in certain positions. Now, I'm already preempting myself because that will likewise be a point that we will be discussing. But then again, as we mentioned here, the appeal really was coming from the fact that uh, Salome was the auntie, and James and John happened to be first cousins. And again, as I mentioned to you, we are to be very careful. I mean, it's all a matter of divine appointment. Let God decide where the pieces will fall. Let God decide how he would appoint people. And that would include those who happen to be our relatives. So let's have a look at the sobering response in verses 22 to 23. So let's talk about the required suffering in verse 22. It says, But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, We are able. Now, I don't really know if James and John understood what the cup was all about. Well, probably they thought it was a necessary prerequisite, but I don't think they fully understood what it was. So I'm going to break this down to you. 
Now, one of the things that you will notice here, however, is that Jesus did not correct Salome as to the fact of his coming kingdom. His only question was addressed now to the two sons, the first cousins of Jesus Christ, James and John. The you here happens to be plural, and it is apparent that they had urged their own mother to make this request. And so they were... They were people who probably pushed their own mother and say, use your, uh, use your anti-authority to tell Jesus that we should be on his left and on his right. Now, I would just like to say that there is nothing wrong with desiring positions of power, authority, and influence for as long that is, as it is tempered by a desire to serve and a desire to glorify God. In other words, the, great, the desire for greatness is not egocentric. The desire for greatness is so that you might not, it's not because you want to be admired or, or worshipped by people or to be put on a pedestal. The desire for position of power, authority, and influence is, is driven by a desire. I want to serve people. I want to be a blessing to people. And then ultimately, it has to be with a desire to glorify God. Lord, I, I want to achieve this, not for myself, but Lord, I want to achieve this for your glory. And so for as long as those happen to be our motives, there's nothing wrong with desiring greatness. Remember that Paul, in writing to Timothy, commended even those that had a desire to serve as elders. So again, there's nothing really wrong. In fact, again, Paul was commending those who had this desire. Incidentally, I'd like to tell you that at that time, to be an elder would mean that you would, you would have to put your life at risk. Why? Because Christianity at that time was not popular. In fact, um, in Judaism, it was considered a cult. And among the Romans, it was also considered as a strange uh, religion. And again, it was likewise considered as a cult. And so you could be persecuted for it. You could lose your property. You could be martyred. I mean, people can look down upon you. You could be a pariah. And so, again, if you had a desire to become an elder at that time, most definitely your motives had to be pure. Now, Jesus, however, sets the prerequisite for, quote-unquote, bigness. So here's what he asked James and John. He asked them if they could drink the cup he was about to drink. Now, the drink here is an Aris tense and is an inquiry if they could fully go through what Jesus was going to go through. In other words, Jesus was speaking of his coming death on the cross. And incidentally, that is the cup that he was referring to. And so he was asking, in a sense, are you willing to die together with me? Are you willing to be crucified together with me? Now, without thinking, without any thought, and, and again, because they had tuned out, remember, they had tuned out the, the crucifixion of Christ. They were not mindful of it. They were not thinking about it. I mean, they, they probably heard it in one ear and it came out the other ear. And so, unmindful of the cross, they said, we can. In other words, they did not realize what they were getting into. That is suffering much for the sake of the kingdom. And sometimes that is the mindset of a lot of people. A lot of people want greatness, but they're not counting the cost. They don't think there's a stiff price to pay. Well, let me tell you this. The price of leadership will always be costly. The price of leadership will always mean certain sacrifices made. The price of uh, leadership means that there are certain things that we have to give up, precious things, things that we treasure. And again, it might involve 
much suffering. The question we should ask, therefore, if we are willing to go through, is if we are rather willing to go through excruciating experiences in order to achieve greatness for the glory of God. So let's pause for a moment. Let's have a Selah moment. And let me just ask you this time, are you willing to suffer for the sake of Christ? Are you willing to gain greatness by going through the path of suffering? And that's something, again, that we have to ask ourselves. And so if, if you have no desire or willingness to suffer for Christ's sake, then forget about greatness. Because God wants those who will be great to go through the furnace of fire. And I will tell you the reason why God wants that to happen. But let me share to you a story. In Richmond, Virginia, in Richmond, Virginia rather, a cemetery, a large monument stands in memory of John Jasper, a black preacher who was famous for delivering spell-binding funeral services. An observer who attended Jasper's meetings at the time was, was awed by his oratorical skills. And he said, I've always liked fine preaching. Oratory has a resistless charm for me. I bow to the man who thrills me. Now, if Jasper wasn't the soul of eloquence that day, then I know not what eloquence is. He pointed scene after scene because he lifted people to the sun and sank down to despair. And he plucked them out of the hard places and filled them with, with shouting. And so, yes, he was, he was a great, great preacher. But what people did not know is the stiff price Jasper had to pay before God used him mightily. The first night of his marriage to Elvery Whedon, a slave from Williamsburg, Virginia, Jasper's owner sent him to Richmond, and he would never see his new bride ever again. And because, of the, slave, because the slave owner thought that he might try to go north to freedom, he was never permitted to revisit Williamsburg. Months later, his wife wrote a letter asking him to return. And when Jasper was not allowed to do so, guess what happened? She decided to remarry. Oh yes, that is the stiff price to greatness. I like to cite some biblical examples. Let us not forget that before Joseph became prime minister, of Egypt, he was first sold by his brothers into slavery. And from a slave, he became, he became a prisoner because of a false charge of rape coming from Potiphar's wife. And before David became a king, he was running as a fugitive from Saul, hiding in caves and uh, going from place to place, even going beyond the borders of Israel because of his fear that Saul might catch up with him. And then before Moses became the shepherd of Israel, he was first a shepherd in the desert for 40 long years. So be mindful of those examples. And those examples are not idle examples. They are examples intended to teach us lessons in life. And that is why those stories are there. Those narratives are there to serve as examples for us that we might understand how God deals with his servants, how God deals with his people. And I think it's very important that we meditate and study all of these narratives and, and see them as, as examples for us, models for us, paradigms for us. And, and so when we go through certain difficulties, we will no longer be surprised because we understand, well, this is how God deals with his servants, most especially those whom he places in high positions, positions of power, fame, or, or strength. And so we have to be mindful of that. Let me just share to you another example. Charles H. Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. Guess what? He was only 17 when he filled to overflowing the church of which he was the pastor. At 19, he was called to a historic church in London. And at 26, he built the Metropolitan Tabernacle, the largest Baptist church on earth 
at that time. He also produced several books and his sermons were circulated worldwide. His life, however, was filled with so much suffering. He was severely criticized by various newspapers and also by pastors themselves. And following the birth of his twin sons, his wife was too unwell to leave their house for 15 long years. Now, he himself suffered from gout and experienced incredible pain, but also its accompanying agony of mental depression. By the time he was 30 years of age, uh, Spurgeon's frame began to show signs of wear and tear. The disease known as gout had developed in his body, and as time went on, he was often confined to bed, suffering great pain. He says, for instance, and I'd like you to hear his statement, it is mercy to be able to change sides when lying in bed. Did you ever uh, uh, try to turn and find yourself quite helpless? Did others lift you and by their kindness only reveal to you the miserable fact that they must lift you back again to the old position for as bad as it was? It was preferable to any other. What mercy I have felt to have only one knee tortured at a time. There were a host of other things that brought great difficulty in Spurgeon's life, and his life was marked by great suffering together with his wife. But guess what? He is the prince of preachers. Guess what? His writings, his sermons are still being used, referred to even up to today. This generation still knows Charles Haddon Spurgeon and is quoted many, many times in pulpits, in Facebook posts. Uh, he is used in many writings, in many books up until today. I mean, it's, it's been hundreds of years. And yet, friends, God is still using all the things that he had written and he had shared. What a wonderful, glorious, great, powerful life. And yet, he suffered much. Many of us, sadly, want the crown of gold without the crown of thorns. Many of us desire exaltation without the crucifixion. Many of us want the resurrection without the garden tomb. And many of us want the heights of heaven without the depths of valleys. There are no easy paths, dear friends, in God's kingdom. And i just like us to be reminded of that. So friends, again, love God, serve God, even desire greatness. But understand there's a price to pay. There's a cost to the pathway of greatness. And you have to be mindful of that. And again, that comes with a greater purpose. And I will relate that to you as we go through this sermon and even as we go to the next. But again, friends, we have to be willing to pay the price. So in verse 23, we're going to talk about the divine appointment. Verse 23, it says, He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Now, let's, let's make something clear. The object of this sermon is not to discourage us from desiring great things for God, but for us to know this is about awareness, that when we ask for greatness, we may also be asking for the cup of suffering. So that's something that I just want to plant or embed in your minds and hearts because some of us can be so naive that we think that greatness is just something that is within our reach for as long as we have those intellectual resources, for as long as we have those connections, for as long as we're brilliant, for as long as we have the necessary equipment. We might think that, well, it's easy. No, friends, we just have to understand that there is a price to pay. Now, of course, when the Lord says, are you willing to drink my cup? Our response to the Lord when he asks us is that, yes, we can. Not in the unconscious way, 
of James and John, but in a conscious and willing way. And why should we be willing? Well, we should be willing because Christ has redeemed us. Our names are written in the book of life. We are undeserving sinners. And yet by God, by His grace, has uh, redeemed us from damnation. He has redeemed us from the pits of hell. And therefore, because of that gratitude that we have in our hearts, we should say, yes, Lord, we can. We are willing. Lord, you have done so much for us, and we are willing to love you. And if loving you means suffering in our lives, then so be it, Lord. Let your name be glorified. Now, the phrase, my cup, by the way, is a focus emphasis in Greek. And this indicated that they would indeed share the cup of suffering and death with Jesus. Let me cite to you what had happened to them in their lives. James suffered death early in the early church age at the hands of Herod Agrippa I. We find this in Acts chapter 12, 1 to 2. John suffered in exile in the island of Patmos and according to tradition was thrown into a boiling cauldron. But miraculously, miraculously he survived that. Now, this is not to say that we will become martyrs. I mean, not necessarily. But we are to be prepared to suffer for His name's sake. And there are various degrees, really, of suffering. And the point is, we just have to be willing. Because, after all, it is for our own good. In fact, it is for our own sanctification. And there is a purpose in why God allows us to go through that crucible of fire, to go through that, that dark tunnel, there is always good reason. Now, when we ask for specific positions of honor, of, of power, for example, we have to understand that, that at, at that time was not Jesus' prerogative as implied in the contrast uh, emphasis. And what we find in, uh, is that the Greek word this and the focus emphasis of the word mine, all of this indicates that it was not for Jesus to appoint them in those places. Those places will be filled, but it will be filled by those, according to Jesus, whom the Father the gracious and generous judge will appoint. And so, being in positions of power, listen up, is a matter of divine appointment. In other words, this is not something that we can manufacture. This is not something that, that we ourselves should, should strive. This is a calling under God. And therefore, we are to respond to the calling that God gives to us. And for some people, the calling for them is for greatness. And that greatness is not for themselves. That greatness is for the glory of God. That greatness is for the extension of God's kingdom. So we are to be mindful of that. And, and we are not to be selfishly ambitious. We are not to be egocentric in our desire for power or, or function or position. I mean, let God decide. Let God's will be done. Incidentally, the word prepared is in the Greek perfect, which speaks of an abiding action, which may indicate that once God gives those positions of authority, the left and the right, it is for, for them forever in eternity and speaks of God's graciousness and magnanimity to bestow this blessing. Well, up until today, we still don't know to whom the left and the right have been given to. And perhaps uh, eternity will reveal that to us when we are brought home by the Lord Himself. Now, by the way, this is not a teaching which tells us that we cannot ask God for positions of influence only that we cannot ask God for specific positions. So I can pray to God, Lord, I want to be great in your kingdom. 
great so that I could serve you more, great so that I could influence more people, great so that your name could be glorified even more. I could be a beacon and a light to a lot of people. But I'm never to ask specific positions, like to say, Lord, I want to be the best and the greatest evangelist of all time. That is not for us to decide, dear friends. God is the one who determines that. So here's a question. Also, the question may arise as to why God would want us to go through difficulties before reaching great heights of glory. I like that question, and it's a question I would love to answer. And the answer to that is I believe the answer is so that we may not worship whatever greatness God gives to us, lest it become a snare to us and therefore destroy us. In other words, God does these things for us to be able to handle well our successes. And that's something that is very, very important, that we be able to handle the successes in life, not the other way around, the success handling us or the success taking hold of us. That should not happen. I mean, we need to have a handle to our success and we need to be mindful. Whatever success I have, the glory belongs to God. Only God deserves the glory and the praise. And, and that is why in the example of, of Paul, we find him going through suffering. And we find the reason in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and following. It says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So there you go, dear friends. That's the reason why God at times allows us to go through the furnace of fire. It is to melt away the dross, to melt away the pride, the ego. And you know, this is something that Pastor Edmund continually reminds us, that we must not let our ego to come in the way. And oftentimes that's our problem, our ego our pride, our sense of self-entitlement, our, our sense of, of uh, worth. And, and that should be removed from our lives. That is really dross and filth. And we just have to empty ourselves that we might be filled with the power of God. And here we find Paul praying three times, Lord, take away this thorn in the flesh. And God never granted that to him. God allowed him to have that thorn in the flesh. And again, the reason is very clear, to keep himself from exalting himself. As the Bible says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who boasts, boast that he knows me. And so friends, the rule of the kingdom is before the crown, the crucifixion comes first. Before the rejoicing, the garments of mourning come first. We are not to fear, for the Lord says, The battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. As Paul himself said, as God himself said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. Trust the Lord that as you go through fire, God himself, God's grace will be abundant in your life. And today, incidentally, uh, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, dear friends. And once again, let us remind ourselves what Christ has done for us. The bread symbolizing Christ serving 
as our substitute, to die in our place, to die for our sins, so that our sins would be covered by the blood of the Lamb. The wine symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Bible is very clear in the book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And therefore, we are indebted to God. And friends, if you have not yet received the free gift of salvation, you have to understand that all you need is to cry out to God for mercy upon you, a sinner. You have to acknowledge to God that you are a sinner. And friends, let me tell you, you cannot be saved by good works because the standard of God is perfection. And as the Bible says, if you stumble at one point of the law, you have broken the whole commandment. And so that being the case, Jesus Christ himself said, with men, referring to salvation, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So salvation is all by God, all by grace, all by faith, accomplished by the cross of Jesus Christ. That alone has brought salvation. And so what do we do? We receive Christ. We repent of our sins. We receive Christ, His person, His sacrifice. And friends, when you do that, and when you ask God to change you and mold you by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be born again. Your name will be written in the book of life, never ever to be erased again. And that's when you can celebrate the Lord's Supper meaningfully because you will remember as you hold those elements, you will remember what Christ has done for you. Let us now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us come before the Lord in prayer at this time. Lord, we remember your goodness and your love towards us. We thank you, dear Lord, for the free gift of eternal life, the free gift of salvation. Indeed, Lord, it's all by grace, it's all by faith, and it's all by God. And to you be the glory, soli Deo Gloria. And Lord, as we partake of the bread and the wine, Lord, may we remember all you've done for us. And may our hearts be eternally grateful. Let the Spirit of God apply these truths in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of the bread and the wine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just bless you and thank you for today. Our hearts are full. We are grateful. We are grateful, Lord, for you have blessed us beyond measure. And today, once again, Lord, we just pray that you might minister to your people, those who are listening to us right now. And whatever you have achieved today, you alone, deserve the glory, praises, and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, uh, if you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel and Facebook page, please do so. We want to spread the word around. So kindly share it to as many friends as possible. And keep yourself updated by hitting the notification bell in our YouTube channel as, as well as in our Facebook page. And by the way, we're coming out on FEBC radio stations all over the Philippines. 
Uh, we're coming out every Sunday on this day as Sunday at 9.30 in the evening. And then GCTV, we come out 6.30 in the morning every Sunday. And we are on Light TV as well every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. We hope that you can join us. Spread the word around, friends, because Christ is glorified. God bless you all. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. Our radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM Broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 a.m. to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Zamboanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from Station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Greetings everyone, we already have three weekend services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Cebuano service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000060800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234811. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. 
account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 0010006080, and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph. Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give. And then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.